Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Welcome to the second day of the lecture series. Today we will pick up from where we started uh, last week. Uh, last week. Uh, we, we discussed the fact that a laser is basically a cavity with two mirrors at the two ends. And these mirrors were labeled M1 and M2. And in between these mirrors, we placed a medium, which we call the gain medium or the active medium. And this gain medium comprises the solid, liquid or the gas in which population inversion can be achieved. So that stimulated emission overcomes spontaneous emission and lasing operation can be attained. And uh, the other day we also looked at a graph in which we plotted the pump energy on the horizontal axis and the gain on the vertical axis and we observed that as the pump power increases, the gain increases until the gain steadies off at a certain threshold value of the pump, our threshold. So what is happening in the laser is that we are supplying more and more power to the laser medium and the population inversion delta n is increasing as the pump power increases. At a certain threshold value, the population inversion latches on to a steady plateau value and the population inversion cannot increase beyond this latch value. The reason is that as population inversion increases, the rate of stimulated emission also increases. So more photons are being emitted into the active medium. However, if we plot the intensity of the light that is emitted with respect to the R pump, we observe that below this threshold value of the pumping energy, no light is emitted. However, laser operation starts when the pump energy exceeds the threshold point. So we observe that laser operation starts at our threshold and as we increase the pump energy, the number of photons emitted per second contributing to the laser light also increases. So this is where we finished our previous lecture from. Today we will start off by discussing that this laser cavity is very similar in spirit to a very simple resonator and the simplest resonator we can think of is a string with its two ends fixed to two firm supports. The length of the string L is fixed and we know that if we excite this string there will always be nodes at the fixed supports. So you can have a fundamental frequency being excited which is simply a single loop or half a wavelength of excitation within these walls or you could have something like this which is twice the frequency of the lowest frequency mode or you can have higher frequencies excited. But in each case there exist nodes at the ends of this resonator. So only precise frequencies can be excited in this cavity. And there is a precise relationship between the frequencies that can be excited and the length of this cavity. And that relationship is that this length should be equal to an integer m times half the wavelength. This is a very simple formula that we are all very well aware of. And if we express this relationship in terms of frequency, we get the following. The integer is multiplied by the speed of the wave. B 
divided by the now wavelength is the speed divided by the frequency f the speed of the sound or the speed of the wave that is traveling on the string is v but if we consider this to be a laser cavity if we consider this to be a laser cavity then we have to consider the speed of light inside this cavity and v becomes the speed of light divided by the refractive index of the cavity multiplied by 2f and we can express f in terms of omega n sorry n can be 2 f is omega over 2 pi the 2s cancel out so we are left with pi c n cavity omega times our integer n so there is a precise relationship between the frequencies that can be excited in this cavity and the length of the cavity so we slightly rearrange this formula and obtain the following result omega equals an integer m times pi c over n cavity l so only certain frequencies can be excited in this cavity now for the laser cavity these fixed supports are in fact the mirrors and the gain medium is in between these mirrors and what is the wave that is traveling inside uh, this cavity is not in fact a traveling wave it's a standing wave of electromagnetic radiation and because of maxwell's rules that apply the boundary conditions the electric field has to be zero at the mirrors exactly analogous to the condition of having nodes existing at the fixed supports so for a laser medium we also have a cavity which is also called a laser cavity or a resonator in which we have a standing electromagnetic field inside the cavity with the electric field being zero that is having nodes at the mirrors and having only precise frequencies uh, and the frequencies are given by this formula and it and they are related to the length of the cavity so what we learn is that in a laser cavity only precise frequencies can occur so laser operation can only occur given the length of the cavity for precise frequencies if you know the length of the laser cavity the length of the laser medium only these frequencies can exist now this is a macroscopic relationship and if we plot these frequencies on another plot let's say we have omega here which is a frequency axis only precise frequencies are allowed and so there is a finite spacing between these frequencies delta omega and that spacing is given by pi c over n cavity l so if you have a laser cavity this simply light trapped inside a box inside an enclosure with the known length we talking about very simple geometries only precise frequencies can exist so laser operation can either take place at this frequency or this frequency or this frequency or one of these frequencies however this is a macroscopic view uh, we can just use classical mechanics to come up with these frequencies that can be excited inside a cavity but there is also a quantum picture we know that laser operation takes place between two energy levels a and b now these energy levels are inside an atom ion or a molecule and laser operation takes place when we achieve population inversion delta n between b and a now there is a precise energy spacing between these levels given by h bar omega naught where omega naught is the frequency separation between these levels now if you look at this atomic transition this transition occurs at a certain frequency omega naught then the question is this is a fixed frequency given by the internal energy level diagram so if you look at the spectrum of this atom 
you plot the frequency here and you plot the intensity of the light that is emitted through these transitions you will get a peak at omega naught and this is a fixed frequency this frequency may or may not be one of these frequencies that are allowed by the cavity so we have to consider both the properties of the cavity as well as the transitions between atomic levels but my class knows this very well that if you look at the spectroscopy of an atom if you look at which transitions are allowed inside an atom you will never get a sharp spectral line you will never get a delta function that is peak only at omega naught and the reason for the simplest reason for this is the uncertainty principle if you know omega naught precisely you know the energy of the system precisely but that is not allowed by the heisenberg uncertainty principle so no matter what you do no matter how sophisticated a spectrometer you make this spectral line will in fact be a broad line it will be centered at omega naught which is given by the frequency separation between these levels the spectral line will be broad there will be flanks or wings on either side of omega naught so this spectral line has a certain bandwidth let's call that bandwidth pw so this picture comes from the cavity from the macroscopic picture and this picture comes from the quantum mechanical structure of the atom there are three reasons why this line can be broad the first reason is simply because of the uncertainty principle this line can be broad because of lifetime broadening it can be broad because of collisional broadening or pressure broadening so if you have a laser which comprises an atom uh, an atomic gas such as the helium ion laser or the nitrogen laser or the carbon dioxide laser the entities are colliding with one another because the gas has a certain pressure when a collision takes place a de excitation takes place and that causes broadening of the lines and the third reason why broadening can occur is called doppler broadening now you have a detector that is detecting the frequencies emitting from a large number of atoms there are some atoms that are moving away from the detector and some atoms that are moving towards the detector and so these lines these atoms which are moving in different directions will in fact result in lines with different doppler frequencies and when one takes the sum of all of these frequencies the total line is broadened so there are different mechanisms which cause the broadening of this line now we have studied the possible allowed frequencies due to the cavity structure and the allowed frequencies due to the atomic structure now let's draw the atomic transition as a function of frequency on top of this curve so this green line shows the atomic transition it has a certain bandwidth pw so now the picture is getting clearer because of the cavity because of the macroscopic structure of the laser certain frequencies are allowed but you are limited by the allowed frequencies due to the atomic transition and if you superpose the two graphs on top of one another we see that these are the frequencies that are allowed by the cavity but the atomic transition acts as an additional selector or an additional filter so only those frequencies can be excited which are allowed both by the cavity structure by the resonator structure as well as the atomic structure and we observe that even though this frequency is allowed by the cavity no atomic transition takes place at this frequency so the laser light will not comprise light at this frequency laser light may comprise light at this frequency because this frequency is allowed by both the cavity and it also lies within the within this line shape function the atomic line shape function even though the intensity will be very small because 
this is really outside the bandwidth of the line chain function, but it's possible that this frequency can be excited. This frequency can be excited because it's permitted both by the cavity structure and the atomic structure. But we also know that there are losses inside the medium. So we can also draw a line that represents the losses. Let's call this line the loss line. 